Hey, Westside family, welcome to Palm Sunday. So glad you could join with us today. Uh, as usual, we have a tremendous service ahead of us, and I'm so excited about uh, all the different facets and the individuals that are participating to put this service together. We have, of course, our worship team doing another great job in leading us in our time of worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. We have two great testimonies sharing on God's Word and how His Word has been an anchor to their souls, and I'm sure that will be an encouragement to each and every one of you. I will be continuing my series that I'm calling Embracing the Cross, and as we're leading up to, to Easter Sunday itself, focusing on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it has been an enriching teaching for myself, and I trust and uh, pray that it has been an encouragement to each and every one of you as well. Uh, first of all, though, I just would like to uh, share family news. If you have not heard uh, up to this point, uh, our beloved sister, Trish Johnson, has passed away and is now in the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ and in heaven. And our condolences to the entire Johnson family and our prayers are with them uh, today and in the coming days and in the coming weeks. And at this time, uh, Pastor Marlowe is prepared uh, a statement and a video that he'd like to share with us concerning the passing of Trish. Good morning, church family. Well, Friday uh, evening, um, actually Friday afternoon, we, we knew the time of Trish's departure for heaven was, was near. And we gathered as a family and spent some time together, said our goodbyes. And the family all left, and Trisha and I were left. And uh, about 8.25 on Friday evening, she passed away very peacefully and went to heaven. And uh, I just want to express my thanks and my appreciation for all the thoughts and prayers that have been shared from many people, and especially from our church family. And so, again, thank you from the very depths of my heart for your love and your support during this time. Um, you know... Uh, it's interesting, um, a lot of people uh, want to know how I'm doing, uh, and I'm doing as well as I can do under these circumstances. Uh, and then they want to know, is there anything that they can do? And at this particular point in time, uh, just keep praying. Pray that God continues to work in our family, and that we'll continue to walk through this process of life without someone who's been very important in our lives, and that's Trish. And uh, so... Uh, again, Trish would have appreciated your flowers. Pastor Marlo, on the other hand, uh, doesn't really appreciate flowers. So please don't send flowers. And at this particular point in time, everything that we have need of has been looked after. So I know that you'd like to do something. Uh, maybe sometime in the future, we can connect and, and you can find something that you can do. But as for now, we're doing fine as a family. We just thank you so much for your love and support during this time. And then, of course, on uh, Sunday afternoon at 3.30, we are going to share as a family with any that would like to join with us virtually, but we're going to share as a family a celebration of Trisha's life. And it will be filled with, uh, I'm sure, a lot of emotion and some stories and just a little bit of the chronicling of the life that uh, Trish lived. And so we'd invite you to come and you'll find on the website that there will be a link for you to join us on the YouTube channel. So thank you so much. And again, today, uh, Trish is in heaven rejoicing and you can just imagine uh, the excitement that she has there and seeing her mother and family and friends and, and people that have gone on before her. So from our family, thank you to each and every one of you for all of your love and your support.
could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to where my soul and bear my shame the cross has spoken Your mercy never fails 
sing that chorus again. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. The Savior has come. The Savior has come with the morning light. The cross has the final word. The cross.
the cross as the final word. He traded death. He traded death for eternal life. The cross. Good morning. I hope you're having a good church service this morning. We are giving you the announcements and taking over Dad's job to give your tithes and offerings. Follow the instructions on the screen. There are too many words for us to memorize. You are, you probably already know what to do. We have a new update from Pastor Paul in Kenya. Where is Kenya? Please continue to pray for the people in Kenya. There is lots of tension and unrest in the village. Kenya's COVID cases are rising and the government is making more rules. I hate COVID. Don't say that. But it's true. To give to the children, they need food. Designate your givings. Polka dot children. Polka dot children. There's a Zoom ladies event coming up. It sounds boring for us, man. But it's still fun for the girls. Here's Levi's mom giving us the announcements. Hi, Westside ladies. We have our second refresh event happening on April 8th from 7 to 9 p.m. I'm really looking forward to connecting with you all again as we had an awesome time of sharing and connection back in February. So for this upcoming event, we have several ladies um, in our body who are going to be testifying to the power of God's spoken word, his rhema word, and how God uses his word to develop our godly character, to define our personal ministries, and to give us a vision and a mission for our lives. Each and every one of us has unique and specific God-ordained giftings and strengths so I think this event is going to be faith building and inspirational as we hear stories of how women have received revelation from the Lord and how they've used this um, to define who they are and produce fruit in their lives. So I'm excited to be uh, encouraged alongside all of you on the 8th and make sure you check our bulletin for the Zoom details. I'll see you there. Spring break has been awesome. Easter's coming! Here are the information about Easter weekend. Pay attention! I can't believe there's no chickens to chase. Leave there's a lot of candy for us kids. Yeah! Oh. And one more exciting announcement. If you haven't heard already, I'm so excited to say that we are once again, after four months, returning to in-person worship, starting Easter Sunday. You, some of you may have read the e-bulletin that went out Thursday, and that bulletin was based upon the first 
health orders that were issued earlier in the week that was stating that we were able to have services outdoors. As soon as we sent out that e-bulletin, there was a second health order, uh, orders that were issued indicating that now indoor services were now being allowed. And so we have been working very hard to uh, formulate plans in order to facilitate that face-to-face -face worship again. So here's the plan. So Easter Sunday, we are going to meet uh, up to 50 people. Uh, we have the allowance of meeting up to 50 people, and we will return back to the, uh, to the, to the uh, schedule that we had before uh, we were prevented from coming together in any way, and that's 9 a.m. service, a 10, uh, 11 a.m. service, and a 6 p.m. service, and we will be able to have, again, up to 50 people at each one of those services, and for now, we're launching them just in the main auditorium. And we are allowed under these current health orders, and I say current uh, because they can change, uh, these current health orders are allowing us four uh, days in which we can have worship services. For, so for the month of April, each of the Sundays, we are going to launch those services as I just detailed. And then if those orders do not change, we will then transition to outdoor services starting in May. But I'm so excited that we can once again, as the body of Christ, come together to worship the Lord and give Him glory and hear the Word of God together and see each other's faces and uh, be encouraged as we gather together as His body. We get to come back to church! You better, better give us lots of air high fives. God's not dead! Let's celebrate! We're done here. Phew! Dad's job's hard. Take a listen to some awesome testimonies. Pastor Danny's message. And Pastor Danny's message. And Pastor Danny's message. Nailed it! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Westside family. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Nicole Savenko, and it's a pleasure to be with you, to share a little testimony with you. Now, we know that in Ecclesiastes, uh, the Bible says that to all things there is a season. So we know there are times when there are mountaintop experiences or seasons and valley seasons. We all go through these seasons. Now, one scripture that always blesses my heart is taken in the book of Matthew, Matthew 14, um, the entire chapter, basically. And the chapter speaks about the miracle that Jesus performed by taking um, five loaves and two fishes and fed thousands. He fed the multitudes. So that's a major miracle that Jesus did. And after that miracle, Jesus went, went, uh, went away and he instructed his disciples to uh, get back into the boat and to go, go, go back across to the other side. So I'll start reading from, from, chapter, from verse 24. It said, Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, is it a ghost? But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. How comforting is that? I'll read it again. Jesus said to his disciples, don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then Peter said to him, Lord, if it is really you, tell me to come to you, walking on the water. Jesus said, come. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? 
there's so much so much message so much goodies we can receive from this from this scripture from this chapter it shows us especially peter had faith enough to trust god to get out of the boat to follow god because god jesus told him come but when the storms the bible says from verse 30 but when peter saw the strong wind and the waves he was terrified and began to sink you know, oftentimes when we experience challenges, right now the COVID-19 pandemic is, has stretched and is stretching lots of people, all of us actually. No one has been left unscathed. And this is a season God wants us, Jesus wants us to trust him like never before. For me, God is, God is keep sh sharing with me. Look back, look at the miracles I've performed. Look at my word. My word cannot return unto me void except it accomplishes that which it has set out to do. I can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could even ask or think. Trust me. Have faith in me. And I believe this is a season like never before. God wants us to trust him and have faith in him. Don't look at the situation. Don't look at the waves like Peter. Don't look at all the challenges that, that is clearly around us. But as people of God and people of faith, God wants us to not look at the challenges, but look at his sovereignty, his power, his ability to open doors, his ability to heal, his ability to transform relationships, his ability to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask for or think. He is still a miracle working God and he is our strength. We can stand on him because his anchor holds. Hallelujah. His anchor holds. So my brethren, this morning, I just want to encourage you that because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because Jesus lives, all fair is gone. And because I know who holds my future, your future. Because life is worth living just because Jesus lives. Be encouraged. Let's continue to trust God. Let's continue to have faith. Let our faith be empowered, be strengthened and be enlightened in this time. And we will see the victory and the power of our God in every situation in our lives. Be safe, God bless you, and I love you with the love of the Lord. Bye. Hey Westside family, it's so good to uh, be here with you today. And uh, I just wanted to uh, say quickly before I started, um, just how encouraging it's been to see so many of um, our family members just contributing the anchor verses and the the testimonies of things that God is doing in their lives. Um, it's just it's been so encouraging to see that and just to see how God is working in everyone's lives. Um, and I just I wanted to say thank you to Marlene last week for sharing Proverbs three verse five and six. Uh, that's the scripture that has been on my heart lately as well. It's just really um, diving in and trusting that uh, God has a plan and uh, he will lead us to where we need to go. Um, the, the scripture that has been um, kind of just on my heart lately is Jeremiah 29 11 for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope in a future uh, up until recently I would get stuck there and that's as far as I would go but I've been looking more into you know verses 12 13 and 14 where it says then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and bring you back from captivity. And uh, so just the Lord has been showing me lately that um, 
it's important to just rest and to sit with him and to be with him and to seek him, to seek him wholeheartedly, not just with our minds, but with our hearts, our soul, everything that we have. Um, and so another scripture verse that kind of ties into this for me is Second Peter 3 verses 9. Um, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And so this has been a time for me of really just pressing in, going deeper, trusting in him and knowing that he has um, he has a plan far better than what I could imagine. And I'm just learning to to sit and to trust and to know that he knows the desires of my heart and he knows um, he knows where my path goes. And uh, it's pretty exciting to know that I can just sit in that and know that I don't have to strive. I don't have to work like just to um, I don't have to do it on my own. He's already got it figured out. And uh, so it's just, it's so exciting to know that just sitting with him and walking and trusting and knowing that just asking him, God, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And knowing that he'll show me um, where he wants to go. And so the last scripture that I wanted to quickly share was Isaiah 40 verses 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So that's my encouragement is just to really, you know, sink in, trust in him and just really put your full hope in, in him. And he will give us the strength that we need to carry through and to uh, walk along the path that he's made for us. So. Thanks for listening. I hope it was a bit of an encouragement to you. Um, and I look forward to when we can see each other again in person. Bye for now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Palm Sunday. This, of course, is the day that we celebrate the uh, riding of that humble donkey by the Lord Jesus into Jerusalem that we call the triumphal entry leading up to Good Friday, which is the day that Jesus was arrested, was beaten, was mocked, and was crucified, leading into the resurrection that we celebrate on Easter Sunday. And in these weeks, we have been focusing on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, calling this series Embracing the Cross. We started out a number of weeks ago uh, talking about how Jesus himself embraced the cross. In Matthew chapter 26, we read about the instance where Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed three times that this cup could pass from him. And of course, we know that that cup was providing salvation for all of humanity by going to the cross. And each one of those three prayers, Jesus relinquished his will to the will of the Father by saying, not my will, but your will be done. And in so doing, Jesus provided the ultimate example of what it means to embrace the cross, to surrender one's will to the will of the Father. We also have been looking at the different answers to man's issues and problems that flow from the cross. Uh, we looked at the word sacrifice, and Jesus sacrificing his life on the cross was God's answer for us for our guilt because of our sin. Last week, we looked at the word reconciliation, and because of our alienation, our separation from God, the cross provides the answer of reconciliation where we can now come into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this week, we want to look at the word propitiation, propitiation, which is not a word we use in typical English language, but it is pregnant with theological meaning. Propitiation is the answer to God's wrath. You see, flowing from the cross is the appeasement of God's right and appropriate 
anger. You know, and in some ways I had a little bit of trepidation with this particular teaching uh, because it's first glance, you think of the word propitiation, the answer to God's wrath. And that sounds very negative. And as I started out in this study, I was a little bit nervous that 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 teaching could come across as, as something that's negative. But in fact, the opposite is true. See, God provided the, uh, the appeasement for his wrath through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, which is an unbelievable message, an answer to the one of the primary issues and problems that we have with our relationship with God, and that's God's rightful anger uh, toward us because of our sin. Now, in Romans uh, chapter 3, we're going to read, uh, and our context today is Romans uh, chapter, our passage rather, is Romans chapter 3, verses 21, all the way down to 26. Now, this particular passage in the book of Romans is right after this main section in Romans that deals in a very comprehensive way uh, with the matter of sin. And I'm going to start by just reading Romans chapter 1, verse 17. And that verse says this, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. That is, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so you would expect Paul, the Apostle Paul at this point, to begin teaching about this righteousness, which is by faith. But instead, in verse 18 in chapter 1, he launches on this, in this, in this uh, extensive teaching on man's sinfulness. And we'll look at that in a little bit. But we're going to pick it up right at the end of that section and uh, read starting in Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested from apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, there's our word today, as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Now we read in this passage that God put the Lord Jesus Christ forward as the propitiation for our sins. Now another way to understand the word propitiation is by the word appeasement. And I just want to cite a historical example that is infamous concerning this idea or concept of, of appeasement. It was in September of 1938 and British Prime Minister uh, Chamberlain went to Munich to visit with Hitler. And in this visit, the purpose of it was to broker a peace uh, agreement and to appease Hitler's demands for further expansion. Chamberlain returned home to jubilant, welcoming crowds, relieved that the threat of war had passed, and Chamberlain told the British public that he had, he had achieved peace and honor. His words were immediately challenged by Winston Churchill, who we know history tells us was later to become the Prime Minister. But Winston Churchill declared this to Chamberlain, you were given the choice between war and dishonor. You choose dishonor and you will have war. In this example in history called the Munich Agreement, we see how appeasement does not work. In fact, it can never work when you're dealing with an evil, I would say, demon-possessed individual like Hitler. However, the appeasement that we're talking about, an appeasement to a holy and a righteous God, is polar opposite to that particular illustration. You see, flowing from the cross is the appeasement 
of God's right anger. And I want to make three points here in this teaching of what appeasement, what this propitiation really means and how that we are the recipients of that blessing that flows from the cross. Firstly, appeasement is to a God of love, not primarily of a God of wrath and anger. First of all, appeasement is to a God of love. And we see in our, in our text here today that verse 25 says this, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. So talking about all the times before the period of the cross, God demonstrated forbearance. He withheld judgment. He, he held back from pouring out his wrath on humanity because his primary uh, attribute of his character is that of love. And we read that in 1 John 4.10 as well, which says this, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he had loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so when we think about satisfying God's anger, we are not to think, I think, first and foremost, that he is an angry God that can't wait to punish people who get out of line. Instead, God is a God of love that is looking for a solution to our problem of the, the rightful wrath that is to be meted out toward man's sinfulness. You know, over time and over church history, uh, different uh, parts of the gospel are emphasized. I think about uh, Jonathan Edwards, who was the great awakening reformer in the 1800s. I'm listening to uh, an audio book on his life. And what a fascinating uh, man of God. He in, in intensely pursued God. Intent, with a tremendous passion, gave himself to the, to the preaching of the gospel. But one of the things we see about him, which I find very curious, is his emphasis on sin, which was indicative of, of that generation of the, the, Puritan, um, the Puritan heritage that he came from in that whole New England area uh, in the 1720s and the early 1700s. Uh, but his, his, some of his sermons, in fact, his most famous sermon, had to do with this idea of God's, God's anger. And uh, the most famous one is called The Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And on July 8th, uh, 1741, he preached this message, and here's a little bit of, of what he spoke. He says, The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you, and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath toward you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times so abominable in his eyes as the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. And I read that and I, I think, uh, here's a man that was used tremendously of God, but yet I read this excerpt from one of his most famous sermons, and I, I can't help but think that's, that's not the primary message, Jonathan, uh, of, of the Bible. The primary message of the Bible is that God so loved that he gave his only son, that he first loved us. He, that he provided his son as an answer to that wrath that would otherwise be meted out to us. And I think, and finally in this point, I think of 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 that says that the Lord is not slow. He's not slack in, his, in, in, in meeting out judgment, but he is long-suffering. He is patient not willing that any should perish and that all should come to repentance. And so when you read the overall counsel of the Word of God, you read a God of love whose primary motivation is that of love. And so we have to understand that when we're understanding this idea of appeasement, it's not done to an evil, malevolent dictator like Hitler. Instead, it is an appeasement that is 
to a God whose primary character is that of deep, eternal love for his creation. A second point I want to make about this idea of appeasement is that appeasement is to a righteous God. The first point we made is that appeasement is to a God of love. Here we want to talk about how that this appeasement is to a God of pure righteousness. Verse 26 uh, in, our con- in our passage says this, It was to show his righteousness at the present time. So this idea of propitiation or appeasement was in order to show his righteousness at this time, at this, this hour of the, of, of the cross of Jesus Christ, so that it might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. So God remains to be just, and he also becomes the justifier by sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you think about this idea of appeasement, and if it was to a God who was arbitrary or capricious in one way or another, or was uh, easily irritated, and we had to run around and, and sacrifice chickens without heads or vegetables so that the gods wouldn't be angry with us. That's a, that's a pagan idea. The biblical idea is a God who is right and just, not somebody who goes off the handle and becomes angry all of a sudden because we tick him off, but rather he's a God that is right in his response every single time. You know, the Bible says that, that the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. And yes, our anger can be right at times, but more often than not, our anger is misappropriated. Uh, we are angry because, because our needs aren't getting met. Or we can get angry if somebody's going too slow in front of us as we're driving. And why are we angry? Because it's our schedule that's being impeded. It's all about us and our needs. Whereas with God, it's, it's his response of anger to things that are not right are pure, they are proper, and they are right in every instance. We mentioned earlier how the middle, that, that earlier section in the book of Romans deals with the matter of sin. And just in the verses prior to the passage that we read of this morning, kind of summarizes this idea of man's sinfulness. We're just going to take a little bit of time to read these verses, and it's Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God, All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God in their lives. You know, in my earlier point, we talked about how God is primarily a God of love. But in saying that, we are not to take away from the reality, from the truth of how deep the problem of sin is in our lives. And I'm convinced that we will not fully understand the seriousness of the sin that that is a part of who we are until we get into heaven. And, and the, 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 the problem, the, the, the deep-rooted problem of sin to a holy God is, is so vast. And as we consider our own lives, again, it's not, as we quoted Jonathan Edwards' message, we're not supposed to focus on, on God's anger and wrath. I, I don't think all the time where we, you know, we're to be scared. But on the other side, we need to at times be vulnerable and and ask God to show us where we we fall short of his glory. And what's so powerful about this idea of of propitiation or appeasement is that God's anger is so right, it's righteous, but he found a solution. 
And so as he's in heaven with, with purity and with holiness and, and is obligated to judge sin, that that judgment then flows down to the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and is received and is meted out by Jesus on the cross so that God is then free to love us as, as the way he really intends to and wants to. And finally today, I want to say that appeasement or propitiation is the work of God. In verse 25 in our text today, we read, God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. So God did it. God put Jesus in the place to die on the cross so that the wrath of God could be satisfied. We read in 1 John 2, 2, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see this idea of providing for, for, for the punishment, providing appeasement to God's wrath is God's idea. It's not ours. We're not running around worried about how can we satisfy the anger of the gods. No, God in his righteousness has initiated the provision for the appeasement of the punishment for our sin. And we see that in a beautifully illustrated in the story of, uh, of Abraham, who God called to, to sacrifice, and initially was to sacrifice his son Isaac. And as they were making their way up to the, to the mountain, Isaac says, hey, Dad, where is the sacrifice? Uh, I see we don't have a lamb. Abraham says to Isaac, God's going to provide that lamb. He's going to provide the sacrifice. And, and so supernaturally that the ram comes out of the thicket and so forth, and Abraham sacrifices that ram. But that was a foreshadowing of what God was to do with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for the appeasement of our sins. God initiated it. And finally, here this morning is, today is Palm Sunday, and uh, we're looking forward to Good Friday and then Easter Sunday. And uh, some of the greatest words that you can read in the Gospels is in the Gospel of John in the final moments of Jesus' uh, time on the cross. And he yells out, it is finished. You see, when he's crying that out into the heavens, there's a proclamation of justice. There is a proclamation to all of humanity that God's rightful judgment has been, uh, has been appeased. I have accomplished it by taking on the sins of humanity on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So today as we are together in our living rooms or wherever you are listening to it, let's be reminded, you know what, God's not angry at us. God poured out his anger on his son so that he could demonstrate his love to us. And so if you're walking around with a sense of, of anger or that maybe God's going to be mad at me, uh, we can know from the, the, the central idea from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is that God took that anger. He took, he appeased the wrath of God so that he could show his love to us. And then finally, you think about a, another instance in history. Martin Luther, the great reformer, started out as a monk. And uh, he, was, he was tormented day and night with guilt. And he would fast more than the prescribed days. He would, in, in different ways, punish his own body because he felt so guilty that God was angry at him all the time. But God set him free that that humble little monk back in the, back in the uh, 1500s set him free with revelation from the book of Romans. And he began to understand that, wait a second, God isn't angry at me because he, he, he gave his son to be that appeasement, that propitiation for my sins. And he entered into a new understanding, appreciation, revelation that God is a God of love. So as we focus on the, this idea of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, I trust that we can, with greater appreciation, 
uh, just love the cross, embrace the cross in our lives. Today we focus on this idea of how God is appeased, his rightful anger is appeased because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for that, I am very thankful and I trust you are as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you that you, uh, on that cross, suffered the wrath of God. And you were able, at the end of that uh, punishing period of history, to cry out and say, it is finished. You accomplished it, God. You took the wrath. You bore our sin. And for that, we say thank you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless.